Uh, my name is Kevin Flaherty. I'm with the Alberta Workers Health Centre. For those of you who don't know who we are, we're a long, I guess, 25-year uh, organization here in the province that primarily focuses on, on uh, prevention, workplace uh, injury and illness prevention, and uh, making workplaces safer. But um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to the uh, folks that are here. And uh, if Rachel's still in the room, uh, wow, how lucky we are to have such an informed uh, MLA on these issues. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. You don't often hear politicians that articulate or informed about these issues. And uh, I can't disagree with anything that was said by the two previous speakers. Um, the richness of the detail they brought to this um, is wonderful. I wanted to throw a little curve out there, I guess, because over the years as I've been in the position of dealing with literally hundreds of uh, injured workers each year coming to our door looking for help that I quite often can't, can't give them, or as an organization we're certainly not resourced to, to help the people that show up at our doors, I wish we could. And as I've met with people, thousands of people over the years through our programming and the number of years I've been there, I'm, I'm often struck by the the fact that uh, the numbers say that 150,000 Albertans get hurt every year at work. And we know that's probably about a third or even less of the total. Um, 150 fatalities every year, and we know that's grossly underrepresented, especially if you consider the occupational illnesses and, and uh, people dying from those. So I, I'm often struck by the fact that we're here, um, me as uh, someone who works in the in the area and you a lot of very interested and probably very well connected to the issue people but there's so few of us and it always strikes me that that's a, a really weird uh, paradox and so I've tried to kind of come up with a few thoughts that might maybe shape the discussion not necessarily tonight but in maybe in your heads it has in mind of, uh, of why that is and I think there's some barriers that, that have been put upon us, I guess, as working people when it comes to our, our work. The first one, of course, is that, uh, and I think they affect this issue, and I think the first one is, is that our work takes place behind closed doors, and, and uh, we've allowed our masters um, over the hundreds of years to, to hold that remnant of, of feudalism in their hands and, and have not allowed us into those workplaces in any meaningful way other than to work. And so with the efforts of the Federation of Labor and other organizations, we managed to get glimpses of what nasty little bits happen behind closed doors in, in employment. But for the most part, the stories stay there or they're told over the, a beer at the end of the day or the end of the week. And we have, even though we all work, we sometimes leave those stories at, at that level. Um, partly because of the discussion is, is forced down. We're not supposed to talk about anything about work on trade secrets. It's illegal, you can't take pictures, all those sort of things. So our employers are defining that ground in a way that doesn't make it very easy for us to talk about ourselves. And the divide and rule that takes place in the workplace separates us out uh, in the community as well as we look at the stigma attached to being injured at work. And then I guess another barrier that I see is the barrier of of the definition even, um, rightly so, you, the organizations, uh, an organization, this one and others, of injured workers. Um, but are, are we injured workers or are we workers who are injured? Or in a lot of cases, workers who are being injured um, slowly by horrible work processes that sometimes don't do the damage in a real fast way, but do it over a longer period of time. So, um, we're allowing in some ways, and I mean this in a supportive way, we're allowing ourselves to be defined by the state and by the institutions that, that are there to suppo supposedly help us, like the WCB, to, to separate us out from the rest of the society that we live in and to stigmatize us with that instead of calling ourselves workers who work in dangerous places or work in places where we get hurt and, and then allowing that bond then to be with our sisters and brothers who work alongside us or work across the street or what have you. So I think it's a, it's a in some ways it's a class issue, not a, a just a, a technical issue. And and I wanted to go back then at, at some of the other pieces that divide us out by that institutionalization of workers' compensation. 
and them, them allowing, being there, the history of, I'm all very familiar with the history that was laid out, I did pieces of research on that way back in the day, of how it was done and how it was, uh, the, the system was sort of sold to workers, and it wasn't a, it wasn't a uniform decision by working people to take that on, and there were risks that were raised at the time, back in 19, uh, teens, about, uh, uh, about the, the possible penalties for it. Um, and one of those is that we've now allowed our employers through the WCBs to define what is a workplace injury and an illness and, and instead of trusting our bodies for that, it's okay, Brian. He just won a million dollars. He said he's going to donate it to the Injured Workers Association. <laughs> so, I, I, get it. I just, uh, you know, on, the, on that note, so those hundreds and thousands of people who are unaccounted for are, are, are out there, as, as Randy said, and others have said, and, and they're, they're in, instead of us talking about the, um, who's getting what, we're, we're, we're actually, not, we're, we could be talking about how little it's actually costing society, uh, employers, as Randy mentioned, and others, um, for, the co for the cost of workplace injury. If you were to take those uh, extra five or six hundred deaths that are out there um, re directly related to work that aren't accounted for, what is that costing uh, the system? Why are we not talking about the savings that could be done to the healthcare system if employers were actually paying for the costs? And more to the point, what would the public outrage be if people actually knew? So I think I'm, I'm, I'm raising these not as a a challenge to the injured worker group or the, the people in the room, but I guess it's a challenge to uh, myself and all, all, all of us as a society to start to re-examine this, this, this notion that it's, a, it's a us and they with injured workers. It's just really a question of time. Um, as I get older, I'm certainly convinced that, uh, that I'm, uh, uh, I'm one of those that is being injured right now. And, and the issue then, as we get older, is to the challenge maybe is to use that demographic as well of older workers and, and posing that question to our neighbors who are hobbling down the street and say, where does that really come from? Are you, are you with me? Um, because there's a, there's a tendency to individualize it, our, our concerns because that's how we face the, the solution. If you want to have the injustices faced off and faced alone as we confront the the institution, the WCB, through the appeals, whatever. There's a tendency to seek um, support by the power of our story, which is truly, truly powerful. But the, the, the real power is not in our individual story. The real power is when the person we tell it to connects to that story and realizes it's their story as well. And then we take the next step, which is to take collective action to deal with the issues. Thanks.